Right. With that, we start off with our first session. Uh, for this, we have two speakers from Malabar Investments, uh, Mr. Akshay Mansukhani, who is a managing partner, and Mr. Ashish Gulati, who is a partner. Uh, to moderate this session, we're thrilled to have with us our very own uh, Mr. Bihari Lal Diora, or BD, as he's popularly known. Uh, Bihari Lal works with Abacus as a director. At Abacus, he is part of the investment committee in charge of risk, compliance, finance, and operations. Uh, prior to joining Abacus, he was uh, managing corporate, uh, family office, and university clients, uh, bringing in investment expertise that spans uh, all asset classes. He's also a subject matter expert across a range of tax, accounting, pension, risk management, and capital market policies. Uh, Bihari Lal is also a regular visiting faculty member for advanced finance programs. He began his career as a financial analyst at Credit Suisse and Fidelity Investments, among others where he gained knowledge across the range of sectors, including oil and gas, commodities in the US, Europe, and Asia. He holds a master's degree in commerce from B. Narmada South Gujarat University, in addition to being a rank holder, chartered accountant, certified financial planner, CFA charter holder, and many other certificates. With that, I hand it over to BD to take you through the uh, first session. Welcome, BD. Thank you, Shagun, for uh, uh, those kind words. And uh, it's my pleasure to be moderating the session, uh, uh, the first session on day two on corporate governance uh, conference. And to all our audience, uh, welcome. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are joining. Uh, let me uh, introduce our uh, speakers for the day. Uh, I have uh, Akshay Mansukhani. Akshay is a managing partner at uh, Malabar, uh, focusing on investment analysis and risk management. Akshay joined Malabar in uh, 2009. Uh, and has five years of prior work experience at UBS, focusing on uh, uh, equity capital markets and infrastructure M&A. He has also worked on uh, uh, alternative capital market groups where uh, you know UBS used to co-invest as, or as an advisor and raising capital for the same. Akshay received his BSc and MBA from Wharton School of uh, University of Pennsylvania, where he was selected as Joseph Wharton Scholar. He's a former uh, you know member of uh, Kaya and also completed all his uh, uh, level three examinations for a CFA. Uh, with Akshay, we also have Ashish. Uh, Ashish Gulati, he again, is a partner at uh, Malabar. He has been with Malabar since inception in 2008 and is the senior most member of the investment analysis team. He has over two years of prior experience prior to Malabar in analyzing investment opportunities at SPI Capital Markets, where he was part of the proprietary investment group that oversaw the equity portfolio of approximately $100 million. Prior to that, he has worked with Security Services Group of uh, Stancy and also with um, IDBI. Ashish has graduated from uh, Mumbai University with a degree in engineering and also earned his uh, PGDPM from uh, IIT Kharagpur. Welcome, Akshay and Ashish. Uh, so I think as a flow, I will hand it over the floor to Ashish. Um, Ashish has a few slides and few points to make. Uh, and once I think he's done, uh, Akshay, you can take over and then we'll open the floor for uh, uh, questions. Uh, to our audience, feel free to type uh, your questions on uh, the uh, chat box or Q&A section, and we'll take them uh, once uh, Ashish and Akshay complete their uh, you know, uh, prepared remarks. Uh, over to you, Ashish. Thanks. Thanks, Speedy. Uh, thanks, Shagun. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Hope everyone is keeping safe and fine. Uh, today, Akshay and I are going to talk about you know, how Malabar um, values corporate governance and uh, you know integrity path when we are looking for to invest in a company right uh, this is a learning that we've had over the last 13 years of being in operations in, in india um, you know one of the tools that we use is a checklist right so uh, checklists are kind of something uh, it's like a tool which allows us to ensure completeness as well as consistency right so you know, we have so many things going on, it's possible that we might miss out on something. So a checklist ensures that we don't miss out on those things, right? So when it comes to evaluating leaderships, right? If, if you can move to the first slide, please. Yeah. So when it comes to um, evaluating leaderships, we have a document where, you know, we are looking at five basic things in a management before investing in that company. The first one is passion and focus, right? How passionate is the company management, the promoters, the uh, top layer of the management, how focused are they, right? Second is capital allocation discipline. So look at the historical records of the company, how they've done M&As or um, 
capex, working capital, those kind of things, right? Third is their execution track record. Fourth, very important is the team and the culture, right? So we spend a lot of time on those. But, you know, besides these four, the very first one is actually corporate governance and integrity. So that's a go or a no go for us, right? If we suspect any corporate governance issues, no matter how good the management is in terms of the capabilities, uh, capital allocation, in terms of the team, in terms of the uh, passion focus, we'll just not go ahead and invest in those companies. I think uh, that's something when it comes to small and mid caps, especially in India, uh, that's something we have seen that, um, you know, some of those investments can really hurt the portfolio. Right? So I'll specifically talk about the capital, uh, sorry, the corporate governance and integrity. Next slide, please. So here, you know, we have four sub uh, parts to uh, the corporate governance and integrity, right? The first one is looking at the public documents uh, or any public information that's out there in the market, right? Second is, you know, we have a bunch of questions for the management. Third is, uh, you know, questions that we have for stakeholders. And fourth is the observations, uh, you know, that we have when we are interacting with either the companies or the com company uh, team members, factory visits, or, you know, even uh, doing our diligence on the supply chain side, right? So the first one, um, the public documents one, right? So this is, I think, you know, something which me means that, you know, sitting at your desk, um, what all can you do, right? So just going through the annual reports, related party transactions, and thankfully, you know, over these years, uh, SEBI has done a phenomenal job in getting more and more disclosures out from companies, not just on in annual reports, but also on a day-to-day -day basis on the exchange, right? So uh, they've done a really good job and which helps the minority shareholders tremendously, right? So we have some of this information in the form of say pledges, related party transactions, you know, how are they dealing with other group companies? You know, if they have, first of all, if they have any other group companies, right? Uh, and if they have, then how are they dealing? What are the salaries for the promoters and the Delta that is there compared to the next guy, the management, right? So we, you can caliber a lot in terms of, uh, you know, how the company is looking at governance and also at the team through some of these documents. Now, when it comes to talking to the companies and the management and the promoters, right? Um, you know, I think there are a whole set of questions and answers, questions that we have so where we try to evaluate them. I've just, we just kept a few of them here. So things like, you know, in case we have heard something on the public governance, just honestly, uh, openly try to assess if how they're trying to uh, give a reason out of that, how they're trying to defend it, right? And also observe the non-verbal communication. In Zoom settings, it's difficult, but in person, it's a lot more easier to do that, right? Um, then also, you know, um, uh, what, what we do is like, you know, at the beginning of the meetings, we'll ask them a question for a, like, which has a number, and towards the end of that one, one and a half hour, two hours meeting, again, ask that question to see if, you know, they're not taking, uh, it, it, and it has happened a number of times where those numbers will not match and then, you know, the uh, concern just goes up for us in that case, right? Um, check if, you know, how they're dealing with government officials, if they've had problems in the past. And most importantly, this was something which we learned luckily very early in 2008 itself when the Satyam scam had happened. You know, uh, we were looking to invest very close to investing in a company. and. When we met them, Satyam scam had happened just like a two weeks, three weeks before we met them. And that guy mentioned that, why, why did Raju have to come out and tell to the public, right? Uh, it's just not worth it. But let's keep doing whatever you're doing, right? So it, it was pretty weird, right? So luckily we didn't invest in that company. It, the stock went up 4x from where we saw. It went down 99% after that. It's at zero today, right? So uh, that was a lesson learned pretty early. Next slide, please. Talking about stakeholders, I think this is probably more important than even talking to the management because, you know, when you're talking to the management, there can be some narrative bias. Those guys are um, uh, entrepreneurs. They are, um, you know, uh, they're pretty salesy. So, which is their job, right? So, you know, we, you need to calibre that. But the best way to assess corporate governance in our view is, you know, just talk to people across the supply chain, right? So, right from the employees, ex-employees, uh, the suppliers, vendors, customers, right, uh, bankers. So just talk to all of them and see how 
you know they are dealing with with the with the company right and with the management right you, if you see that you know they're pretty clear the payments are on time um, you know it's all in uh, bank account transfer no cash links you know it gives you a lot more comfort right and also you know uh, you know what we've done is like you know talk to the drivers talk to the security guards to see you know uh, what time they come in what time they go what are their lifestyles um, you know i remember uh, when we were in one of the apparel companies in 2010 we just talked to the driver who was dropping us to our office uh, the company is a car driver right and uh, he said these guys are just working till like 9 30 10 every night including saturdays and sundays the uh, the ceo he goes for a satsang he doesn't have any he doesn't spend money anywhere else right he's just all in, in the business so you know um, just talking to those people helps a lot helps a lot in trying to understand the corporate governance and integrity uh, of the management to some extent right to a great extent i would say not even some extent. then there are some observations right which we, we can which we can do um, just uh, observe how well are they talking about in terms of you know how well the thought process is have they thought through things very well or is this a story that they're giving out uh, to, to the industry right and uh, you know you meet them a couple of times few times five four five times and see if the story is consistent not just with the uh, senior guys but also when you're talking to the next layer of management you know they're all on the same page right that gives you a lot more comfort then when you're visiting their offices or factories you know just uh, uh, we can observe if there's something unusual about how uh, you know how say grand maybe their offices are compared to the profits that they show right or compared to the revenues that they show so you know, need to triangulate some of that uh, um, and uh, you know it happened with one of the uh, com like a, i would say fmcg company that we were evaluating right where uh, you know just looking at the personal lifestyle of, of the person right it just didn't tie up with the uh, kind of margins that he claimed that he would have that he said it's a very thin margin business for me i'm like a contract manufacturer and uh, you know i need to be very frugal it just didn't tie with the lifestyle that he seemed to have it at his office right uh, um, and again you know the corporate governance issues did come out in, in the open a few years a few, couple of years later yeah and again when you're you know talking to the next layer of management are they subsidiary? Are they? I mean, it's okay. You know, in, in India, you know, you're calling someone with a G or a, a surgery, those kind of things, right? I think that's completely fine. But as long as you see that they're openly participating, you know, if they're voicing an opinion, are, are they voicing the opinion in their meetings, right? Are they, how how are they uh, disagreeing to each other, right? So you want to see that level of independence that's given. Uh, it, I think it does play a role in not just uh, the team culture, but also in terms of integrity. Yeah. So I think I, um, those things to cover from our leadership evaluation documents on the corporate governance integrity side. With this, I'll hand over to Akshay to take forward on the remaining part of the presentation. Akshay. Thanks, Ashish. Thanks, uh, BD Shagun, for uh, having uh, Ashish and I uh, talk today. If we could. Move to the next slide, please. So, in 2000, uh, Clause 49 of the listing agreement basically started our journey on the corporate governance side here in, in India. And um, as we've, uh, as the markets have evolved, and as uh, you know, the, there's been a sense of appreciation for the level of uh, for the participation of an independent uh, director. I think we want to touch upon both uh, you know, the role of an independent director, but also as a shareholder, uh, our skin in the game effectively means that we have a very high level of interest with how uh, a business conducts itself. Um, and it can range uh, across committees as, and obviously at the board level you know, as well. So uh, I know uh, yesterday uh, on the role of the independent director, uh, you know, a few of these points may have been covered, uh, but just to quickly, you know, go through uh, while the uh, committee chair is ultimately responsible for uh, the final decisions uh, that come through uh, on the audit committee. I mean, just to share some uh, insight, uh, the board for earning to the board that uh, the board meeting that comes together to finally release earnings 
cannot actually be done once the audit committee um, actually uh, you know approves of where the where the numbers are uh, on the remuneration committee uh, clearly there are promoters and family members that uh, are part of uh, you know the business and trying to get a sense uh, for what is industry practice um, is is important and then recently uh, the esg uh, uh, piece has become important for investors where uh, the activity level of the csr committee is also you know pick, picked up um, at the board level um, i think here uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, you know ethical business practices need to be followed uh, but really it's the mindset of uh, the promoter uh, you know do they have the mindset that a clean organization with good decision making and having the relevant uh, board members uh, present actually enhances shareholder value you know over the over the long term and while the rule book uh, is there for all to see the devil is in the detail when it comes to the actual execution of um, you know strong uh, corporate uh, corporate uh, governance um in terms of uh, you know the board level decision making it's uh, some of the i've just highlighted here some of the the key decisions that the board makes uh, but uh, uh, really, outside of the day-to-day -day, uh, work, the capital allocation is where uh, the board uh, specifically steps in and guides uh, the business uh, because those are really big decisions uh, that uh, you know that the company makes. And ultimately, from a shareholder value perspective, uh, having the right corporate uh, sorry capital allocation makes a massive difference uh, to final you know shareholder um, returns. Um, Moving to the next slide. So case study wise, uh, I think this is the part that gets us, you know, exciting, it gets us excited as to why we conduct this level of, uh, you know, diligence uh, and what the answers are. So taking a step back in the 1970s, unfortunately, our tax rates in India were north of uh, 90% and uh, uh, there may have been less of an incentive, you know, to show uh, profits and sometimes that mindset has has passed through uh, you know family members and till today we see uh, sometimes very bad uh, corporate governance uh, you know practices including you know fudging of uh, the numbers uh, so taking a case study we had um, a company with you know a well known uh, brand and good you know revenue and and earnings numbers and uh, you know we were trying to uh, basically appreciate, you know, what that level of uh, the, the revenue numbers and if they tied into what was being reported. And this is something for us, which is our bread and bread and butter, um, speaking to distributors, um, stockists, conducting plant visits. Uh, these are all things that, you know, come naturally to us because we've sometimes, uh, you know, had the bad experience. And in this specific case, um, what we did uh, was to call up uh, their uh, centers and get the fees that they were charging, uh, you know, for their, uh, you know, as, and, and we basically uh, pretended to be parents uh, to try to get the exact, you know, fees. And we called up 80 of the 250 centers uh, across the country to just get a statistical significant uh, evaluation. And uh, normally uh, 25, 30 data points in each geography is what we do. In this case, uh, we got 80 uh, uh, data points across you know the country and the average fees that we were able to get were uh, was 40 percent lower than what they were reporting in their annual report and uh, you know this was cause for concern you know for us clearly uh, bombay being the, the richest cities in in the country is slightly higher but the rest uh, the fee level is is lower and when we approached the management with this information uh, you could see the the blood drain, you know, from their from their face. Uh, they were uncomfortable, um, and uh, you know, it didn't give a positive impression to us. Um, subsequently, we had uh, interactions with one of the private equity investors in the company and shared our findings uh, with them, uh, and they called us back um, uh, after a bit, saying, "Hey, we've actually uh, found out the exact same information that you have." And we're exiting, you know, the the business. Uh, the market, you know, didn't catch on uh, until when the auditors resigned 
um, you know, a few uh, quarters later, and uh, the stock is down you know, tremendously, you know, since uh, since then. So for us, the learnings uh, are to really triangulate uh, the numbers, uh, try and match what uh, management says, you know, and and what they do. And the big learning is sometimes uh, having a a marquee investor on the private equity side in the company does not necessarily mean that uh, the corporate governance is uh, uh, is a okay. Um, so uh, I'll come to more learnings, but moving on to the next slide, please. So this is just a quick one on the in, the uh, different indices that have recently been created uh, by the MSCI, both on the emerging market side as well as uh, for India, where uh, companies. Uh, that basically have, have a higher threshold uh, for environmental, social, and governance metrics, um, you know, are clubbed uh, together. And this is the kind of the back testing uh, for the last many years, how much the outperformance would have been if companies had uh, kept themselves to a higher, um, you know, ESG standard. Uh, and recently, you know, multiple uh, uh, changes have happened, both in terms of organizations such as the UN PRI, uh, the principles of responsible uh, investing um, uh, kind of uh, movement where funds themselves are uh, ascribing to the UN PRI saying that, look, uh, we've uh, you know signed up and ultimately we are uh, uh, putting our neck on the line for the companies that we have invested in. And then similarly, uh, there are market participants that are able to give us um, the uh, metrics that they judge uh, ESG uh, by. Uh, in India, it's a little bit nascent where it, it's uh, you know slowly evolving, but globally, uh, these ESG metrics are, are available uh, for a host of uh, you know for a host of companies. Nonetheless, I think the outperformance, which compounds over a period of time, is something that uh, stands out here, and we've had a very similar experience in our. Um, you know, portfolio companies. Moving on to the next slide. And then, you know, no one steps in the same river twice. Uh, so, you know, what can we say are the, the changes in, you know, the, the landscape, the Indian corporate landscape from a corporate governance, uh, you know, the perspective, the three largest, I would say changes. One is appreciation by promoters and management themselves that having Cleaner corporate governance, better corporate governance results in uh, investors giving companies uh, better valuations. And that translates into uh, kind of wealth for shareholders, as well as if uh, companies are looking to raise capital, uh, it's happening at, uh, you know, kind of better prices and the, their dilution is, you know, is, is limited. Um, I think that's been the one, uh, you know, at least from a mindset perspective change. Uh, that we've seen, uh, you know, over the years. I think second is the institutions themselves, uh, the, the rating agencies, as well as the banks, uh, who've given uh, loans uh, out and have been caught with certain, you know, share pledges or, uh, you know, questionable uh, practices at company levels, which finally results during stressed market environments where NPAs, you know, shoot up. Uh, the actual uh, appreciation of clean corporate governance by uh, the banking system uh, has uh, become uh, you know stronger and then last is in terms of the ownership structure themselves as you see you know the recent wave of ipos that have happened uh, private equity investors have learned uh, in many cases to go down the path of control uh, where many years ago there was a lot there, there was a lot higher comfort with just being a minority shareholder where today uh, private equity investors and institutional investors are going down the path of, of taking control and that uh, results in uh, you know further um, you know corporate governance standards being being set uh, because the ownership is you know slowly changing uh, or even as minority shareholders uh, private equity investors have a seat uh, at the at the table um, and these are all changes that we expect uh, you know the landscape uh, specifically on the corporate governance side uh, to be different um, you know, as we, as we go forward. Um, so let me take a, take a pause there. Um, and, uh, you know, BD, uh, if uh, you want to open it up or Ashish, if you have any further questions, sure. uh, 
Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ashish, and thank you, Akshay, for uh, you know those prepared remarks. Um, we've got a few questions from the audience, and I have got a few of them my own. And you, you know, any of you can take it depending on uh, you know uh, where it fits in. But I think Ashish, you talked about uh, character at some point in time in your uh, opening remarks. Now, in credit, we have uh, the standard 4C or 5C model, as we call it, uh, which talks about character, capacity, collateral, and covenant. Uh, you know, these four, these are the four elements which needs to be there before you decide on a credit. I believe capacity, collateral, and covenant are not relevant to equity, but character is something which everybody talks about. I haven't seen a single uh, investment manager who does not talk about corporate governance being already there in his framework or uh, any textbook which doesn't talk about corporate governance being good for the company or otherwise. But if, if, if character of management is what we are thinking as the central theme uh, for evaluating C, uh, you know, uh, corporate governance, how do you define character? Uh, is is uh, plain alone education is a prerequisite? Is there a checklist for you know, defining the character as well? I mean, uh, everything else, what we see is like a mosaic theory. You, you end up uh, figuring out a few pieces, you, know, you try and make, uh, assume a holistic picture, but nobody knows the answer. Sure. Yeah. So, Akshay, you want to take it? Yeah. No, go ahead, Ashish. So, yeah, BD, I mean, uh, there's no, it's, 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 it's a mix of both art as well as science, right? There's no, it's not like a, in physics, right? You have uh, force is equal to M into A, right? It's not as simple as that. It's, it's much more complicated. And that's why, you know, checklist helps um, to some extent, right? I, I'm not saying it's, it's like a, it's, it's not like a Gita for us, right? But it helps, it guides you somewhere, right? Uh, so I think, you know, in assessing character, yeah, I mean, degrees are all, well, honestly, don't matter much, right? Uh, they, are, they only are an indication of the person's academic achievements, uh, but not whether this guy can build a scalable business, uh, a profitable, scalable, sustainable business over time with uh, integrity, right? So I, I think that's where, you know, um, you know, you talk to those four C's at uh, credit, right? But this, the character part, uh, it's, it's all through, uh, you know, through hustling, you just try to figure out whether he's checking most of the boxes, he or she is checking most of the boxes or not. It's difficult. There have been instances even in US, right? Uh, this Theranos case which is going on right now. So it's, uh, you know, even a lot of good institutional investors and very reputed people didn't know what's actually, what's actually going on. So, uh, it is difficult, but I think over time for us, what has helped is, you know, uh, we've built strong relationships in many cities where we've invested in companies, we've invested with them for a decade, you know, uh, through our own investors in India, you know, who are uh, successful entrepreneurs by themselves, right? Uh, you know, we, we'll check with them on, on the, on the so-called character of the, of the person, right? I think it's a small world now, right? Where trying to get a connection, like a second order connection with a management, it's become a lot easier. 13 years back when we started, it was very, very difficult for us to uh, do it in a, like, you know, we, we talk of ROID return on invested time. We, we had to spend a lot of time to get uh, some amount of feedback. Now we have to spend less amount of time to get a lot of feedback. Akshay, do you want to add something on that? Yes. So on the character side, given that organizations effectively are people, and from the top, uh, the character flows down into the rest of the organization. Our diligence efforts, when it comes to an organization, may, may provide an answer to this question. You know, so on operations, uh, we spend a fair amount of time understanding uh, the kind of how a business conducts their you know operations, uh, how they manage relationships, uh, you know, with vendors. Uh, and internally, what's the, you know, ecosystem, you know, within, within the organization. Second is on the scalability of an organization. What we find is that uh, promoters sometimes are yet controlling small checks. They don't give that accountability and responsibility to the second layer of, of management, which sometimes, uh, you know, creates issues. And if companies are growing uh, so fast, uh, having the promoter uh, or the top management as a bottleneck uh, sometimes, you know, creates an, an issue. Third is uh, that's very insightful as to capital allocation decisions have been, have they 
acquired a company that's in a related space so something completely different um, you know what their you know level of you know debt is on their on their books you know when they've issued equity and and all these things uh, sometimes how they dealt with you know minority shareholders in the past which is the fourth point specifically on the corporate governance the ethics that uh, guides itself internally towards um, is revealing for the top management and then last two is passion and cognitive function so on the passion side does the promoter know where they're losing money and on their you know how excited are they uh, and how does that level of excitement fall, flow through to the rest of the team members um, how many companies does the promoter own and manage at one time or is this the only focus you know that the company and the management has and then last is cognitive function uh, this one is very important it's basically how open is the management to talk about the risks that they see in a business and uh, what we realize is the more open the management is the more understanding they are of who they are themselves what are their skill sets what are their strengths and can you actually get people to mirror or, or complement sorry their their skill sets uh, you know within the within the organization what we find is if a company is open to the risks in a business uh, what it, it leads to a much more uh, kind of stronger uh, uh, internal uh, you know kind of uh, th thought process and what we do is we ask le leading questions like we know there's a certain risk to the business and we'll say hey we don't think this risk is a big deal and you know and wait for the management to correct us right and if the management does not correct us then you know it gives us an answer uh, versus uh, if they actually tell us no you're wrong they, this is a big big risk this is how we've dealt with this this in the past it these are all things that go into evaluating management and for us we rank our management a plus a b plus b why because we found that the a plus management uh, land up uh generating out performance on earnings over many years the earnings are much better than what we expected um, and that's how we judge ourselves is fundamentally you know how are these businesses you know performing uh, so just wanted to add that uh, on the character side sure. and when you say you rate management is the ceo cfo is this the promoter or all of them so for us meeting with top management ceo ceo uh, cfo um you know ir sometimes uh, is you know not as as helpful uh, but the second layer of of management uh, you know kind of what are the different uh, heads of uh, you know different divisions uh, you know what is their say uh, and seat at the table and uh, one very good indicator by the way on questionable corporate governance is the junior people in the finance and accounting department do they share numbers with the cfo ceo at the end of the quarter what is the level of transparency that they have with the numbers sometimes when we hear that at the end of the quarter cfo gives us the final quarterly numbers and you know cfo goes into a room with the ceo and then the numbers come to us that's a very clear you know red red flag and uh, i think industry participants as distributors dealers suppliers during stressed market environments how have they dealt how has the company dealt with them has there been delay in payments you know how engaged how many times does the top management go into the field to visit you know dealers distributors stockists what is the pulse that the top management has within the value chain and probably the best source of information is competition if competition grudgingly gives respect to a company that we are evaluating that in our mind has a very heavy weight uh, because uh, they would be naturally inclined to you know not see good things or point out weaknesses or point out things in the past that have happened um so the it's it's a it's a kind of a a full blown analysis and and it depends company by company uh, you know for some in some instances doing a board level discussion is very important so we kind of catch a board member uh, have a long chat with them sometimes doing field work uh, across the country is very important so really it depends uh, company by company uh, what type of work we do sure um thank you thank you for that perspective as a reminder to our audience please keep on sending your questions on the q and a uh, box uh, ashish a question to you i mean uh, obviously corporate don is an important evaluation of management is required do you do that before you start evaluating a business or do you do that once the 
you know, rest of the pieces like the valuation and the business model and everything is done? Or is it like ongoing throughout? Uh, at any point in time, you find the red flag, you stop it. Yeah, so it's an ongoing uh, process for us, right? So, I mean, initially, obviously, we would want to um, get comfort with the business, right? Um, and then only start management interactions because a, it doesn't even look good on a path that, you know, we are not prepared and just going talk to the manager, hey, what you do, right? But so at least uh, have some developed preparation. And uh, once we start interacting with management, so let me put it this way, right? Uh, so probably we are, when we are meeting uh, team members or ex-employees or talking to vendors, right? We are probably spending less than a quarter of the time in talking to the management. 35% of the time is going into talking to people across other stakeholders, right? Other stakeholders, I'm calling, right? Because that's where we get a lot more comfort. And especially when it comes to all these new age companies, uh, you know, luckily it's easy to find some of those either ex-employees or um, especially ex-employees, right? Uh, who you probably have a direct connection with them on LinkedIn, right? So it's much more easier now uh, for these new age companies. I mean, if you have to find a Direct connection for Akshay and me in a steel company is very difficult, but for someone in a you know tech company, it's a lot, 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 lot easier. So that way, uh, you know, it's an ongoing process, uh, and that's where the, you know the last slide which Akshay showed, right? Where you don't step into the same river twice. Um, why you don't step? Because the river is not the same, and the and you're not the, you're not the same, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think companies keep evolving over a period of time. Um, you know, there have been instances, a lot of instances in the past in India and outside India where, you know, uh, the business was doing well, the management was, had good corporate governance, good integrity, but somewhere down the line, they just lost track because they wanted to show mark, the public markets that, you know, they're growing, right? Uh, so, you know, you need to keep evaluating them, keep talking to stakeholders. I admit that, you know, sometimes even we, you know, let off a guard, let down the guard uh, on these things that, you know, after two, three years, we get so comfortable, we stop uh, interacting till, you know, there's, uh, till, 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 till a point in time that, you know, suddenly we wake up and say like, hey, we should actually do it for all the portfolio companies. That, that, that's it. Uh, Akshay, let me ask you this question in a different way. Uh, it's often said that management is the multiplier to the business. So will you select a good company or a good business with a bad management or a, bad companies are, you know, business with a good management. So uh, Warren Buffett has said that uh, when choosing between the reputation of uh, an industry and management or the, the reputation of management, pick the industry because uh, it doesn't make a difference how good the management is. Uh, if the industry is bad, there's only so much, you know, they can do. We modify that in our uh, work in India where we've learned over a period of time that even in uh, an industry that you know, may not be as exciting, sometimes uh, an exceptional management can create shareholder value for, uh, for, for the long term. And so we modified our screening process to actually now be open-minded to include uh, you know, management uh, companies where we've heard great things you know, about management and uh, ultimately, it's just keeping our ears to the ground, you know, for uh, when we do diligence, we always ask, is there any company that you really like or you really don't like? Um, and that is revealing. Uh, we have, I think, over 350 domestic investors where we personally go and visit them in India. Uh, and this is what we tell them at the end of the meeting is, look, if you see any company in our portfolio that you know uh, and you've heard things about, you know, the management, you know, please please let us know. And, you know, ultimately that, uh, you know, kind of that A plus management, uh, the top has to translate also into the rest of the, you know, organization. And so these are things where I think we're open-minded, but uh, to take a step back, you know, we are very numbers oriented as an organization, you know, cash flow growth, ROE, uh, earnings growth in the portfolio. So that's anyway, the filter that we have, um, you know, so it may be that the numbers are strong, uh, the industry may not be as good, but then we hear, hear good things about management. That's kind of when things come together, you know, for us. So the numbers need to do the talking. It would be very rare for us uh, to look at something seriously where the num it's not translating into the numbers. Sure. And in your experience, you know, across, you know, 
let me call it corporate governance patterns do they differ across you know in based on the sector or type of ownership or domestic slash mnc or you know evolving i mean india is always evolving you know what it was 50 years ago or 30 years ago or even 10 years ago is not the same uh, you know thanks to what regulator is doing or you know a lot of these international standards but have you noticed any patterns on any of those things so you know unfortunately we try and stay away from government uh, uh, related businesses you know government as an owner government as a client government as a regulator right we found issues in each of these three buckets and uh, it's not something that we see changing too often because even if uh, there's no corporate governance issues just the ecosystem and the level of excitement uh, is sometimes you know not you know not there however uh, say real estate as a sector typically we would avoid it because uh, there may be corporate governance issues the cash flows are lumpy uh, the timing of the uh, cash flows is uncertain uh, there's a lot of dealing with government bodies so for all of these reasons we might you know typically stay away from real estate businesses however in our screening we are agnostic so we will keep all businesses in there and we have you know uh, had an example uh, you know where uh, we've been pretty you know happy uh, and so let's take an example say nesco uh, on the on the western express highway we were the first institutional investors you know in that business and it did not have that profile that you know i just mentioned uh, it was a kind of a, a very clean land bank there was uh, a, a ongoing cash flows that were coming through it spent a lot of time appreciating the governance you know within the within the business and this was years ago you know and it and it worked out so i to stay away from certain sectors um, uh, we are our screening process results in us Uh, not ev- avoiding those businesses we and we'll quickly discuss we, in our screening we'll have 100 200 300 names where the whole team will spend 3 4 days discussing name by name you know why we want to spend more time and many names will be filtered out but if we run the process and again and again and if we are agnostic we uh, you know hold it to our investors uh, to be able to uh, you know sometimes find companies even in areas or sectors where we may typically you know avoid so i think Uh, not funneling yourself thought process wise and keeping mind the mindset open um, is something that we try and do sure sure and ashish um, you know you talked about the corporate governance checklist i mean i mean these days obviously you have other checklists like whether you have uh, diversity policies in place you have you know uh, employee engagement and you know there are so many things which uh, investors i mean investing companies do disclose in uh, you know their uh, balance sheets uh, i mean are those checklists as important as you know the corporate governance checklist in terms of you know whether you call it esg whether you call it climate or anything else yeah no that's a very good point right so uh, you know this corporate governance checklist is part of the leadership evaluation document that we have led led right uh, that we have and it's one of those five parameters that i talked about right so while within those five corporate governance is at the top but for us it's an and function right it's not an or function so all those five need to uh, tick the boxes uh, the weights or the uh, the weights will vary depending on the sector depending on you know the uh, growth trajectory that the industry has but in terms of um, whether it's a go or a no go corporate governance is obviously always at the top right um, we also tend to uh kind of what akshay you know to to your previous question and what akshay was saying there are certain sectors we just avoid right um, and it's it's a uh, there is clearly falls in the checklist where you know uh, you know whether there are a lot of government dealings that are happening because of or a lot of cash dealings that can really set is driven but to to that point also right uh, over time i think uh, you know the over the, the last decade two decades three decades i think overall as a country the corporate governance has improved right uh, even within real estate we see that you know uh, uh if you if you want to buy an apartment most good developers will say like we don't take cash you have to pay on in white right so that's a good thing which is good good for the country good for shareholders um so you know we need to keep our eyes and ears open and see if things are improving in certain sectors and if that is resulting if people are the market is still not um recognizing that the corporate governance has changed and over time they will recognize so those are good opportunities actually for us sure sure and you know 
if you notice, you know, shareholding patterns of companies across maybe Asia versus Europe or US, you'll find that Asia tends to be more family centric or, you know, uh, uh, family owned. Uh, and, you know, uh, you'll remember SEBI came up with this 75%, uh, max 75% guidelines and stuff like that. And there are so many companies who are yet to meet that. So it's natural that companies, you know, which have been homegrown, which have always been family owned, will hope will have more involvement from, from their families, right? Or more uh, so-called um, influence from the family, even if you have the professional management in place. Why should they be answerable to someone else? In their own eyes, they have developed the business, they have their own uh, you know, setup. So minority in India is a myth, right? You know, minority can take majority for the right. Take an example of PSU or SOE where, you know, uh, government might own minority, but still they dictate uh, this. And with a lot of these m &A activities going around, how do you actually protect minority? I mean, and, and this could be in two parts where when 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 you are looking at the business as a minority and when you are, you are also already part of the business and then you trying to sell, where did the two sort of differentiation happen? Okay. So I think just uh, I completely agree with you, right? That uh, ultimately as a minority shareholder, there's only so much that you can do uh, to change uh, existing you know management now the flip side is that because the companies the management promoter families have so much ownership that they are also very aligned in terms of the long-term you know value creation so how do we do it we do it by building a relationship with the management um, and first of all you know we're investing in you know predominantly public companies so if for whatever reason something changes we can exit uh, but building a relationship with you know, management is, is critical. Uh, and once you do that, then the level of engagement increases and your ability to impact or, or share thoughts with them uh, goes up, right? So, for example, uh, uh, TTK Prestige, Mr. Jagannathan, right? we said, sir, we're hearing some issues uh, on the service side for your products. He said, please get out of my office. And uh, so we came back after a few weeks with 150 data points, right? On with quotes, exactly what the market was saying across all the geographies, statistically significant data, right? We made a presentation to Sir and explained to him that mixer grinders have electrical components, very different from a pressure cooker where you do not have these things and the service level issues are less on pressure cookers. We presented this to him uh, and he called his head of service and we had a three hour discussion with the head of service in terms of what uh, they're doing to rectify the issues. Finally, they launched another plan, even though we were not shareholders, we were invited and we visited the launch of their new plant. Um, and so having, so that's one example, say a mother son Sumi is another example where we've done 24 plant visits in India plant visits in Germany, Hungary, Austria, multiple times, and then plant visit in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where they have uh, the Mercedes GLE plant and spend a full day there. And then when you go back to Mr. Segal and say, look, your plant manager in, in Tuscaloosa told us these are the issues. We understand that they're being resolved. The, to take the time and effort to go there, appreciate the challenges that the business is having, how, what are they doing to fix it? that level of engagement, you know, increases. And so once you are in or say, you know, Hudson, our, our milk business, uh, you know, Sumit, our, our portfolio manager and firm founder has spent three days with, uh, uh, with Mr. Chandramohan visiting milk collection centers in down South in India. And when you're in the car with somebody for three days, uh, that relationship, you, it, it's, you can't shake it, you know, after that, you know, the fact that he would allow you to come through uh, uh, and, and do that. And so now if there's an ice cream plant coming up, you know, with geography, it's coming up, what, what is the capex that's needed, but naturally we would be involved, you know, in that, in that decision making. So uh, yes, we are minority shareholders. We may not have as much voting right on the table to be able to make an impact. But if you build that relationship with a, a promoter or a family, uh, there's a very high chance that 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 open line of communication will be there for, and it's natural that they would ask our feedback because we are an interested party with shareholders. Um, so this is how you know we we do it. If I may add to Akshay's uh, point, right, and we need to uh, elaborate a bit more on the promoter and 
minority shareholders, right? So that's why you know what we're looking for is are, are these companies having a second layer of management which is full of professionals, like good quality, capable professionals, right? Who have been given ESOPs and stake in the company, right? So I think if you have that, uh, where you know the uh, the employees themselves have come to a company um, because they all they have they've been given independent freedom to grow the business the way they want it and getting rewarded monetarily in, in a handsome in a handsome manner right if you see those i mean it's a sign that you know uh, why would someone like a, a professional risk his career uh, on corporate if there are corporate governance issues in that company right uh, so if, if you see some of those signs i mean actually talked about mother sasumi right another framework which we have within the checklist is you know are these guys uh, is the promoter taking a back seat and in a non-operational role and letting the uh, profits run it so mr cycle way back in late 90s itself right he had become the chairman of the company said i'm just a shareholder in the business and i'll not draw any salary my son will not draw any salary we'll just be shareholders in the company and let the ceo and the cfo and all the other plant managers run the business right so that's a very positive sign where you know, those guys have shareholding in the company through esops Right, and they they are the ones who are growing the business because a company like Madison has closer to 190 plants or maybe more now, right? Uh, for one guy to run it is not possible, right? So you want someone who gives or delegates uh, to 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 the next level of management and lets them run the show because that's on that's the only way you can then scale up the business, right? Uh, one guy himself cannot or herself cannot scale up the business. Let me uh, switch gears a bit. I mean. Once colored black, is it always black? What about fallen angels? What about people who have done something wrong in the past or maybe allocated longly or you know bought something out of the blue or gained into some business which didn't make sense? And now obviously some sort of second gen or next gen is in place and they want to revive. I mean, it's like a, a belief in disbelief kind of stories. How do and there was a one manager who called it Chorbane Mo, right? Yeah, I think I don't know that, right? I mean, yeah, you uh, can call it that or you can say, look, you know, Stories which nobody believed in maybe long ago, but now you know you want to give a second chance to sort of. Uh, so is it once colored sort of blacklisted in corporate gone? Is it always like that? Can do people change? No, I think caution uh, uh, and uh, you know it's been a learning for us also that you know you, we need to be open minded and see the changes that are happening, but. The bar for such a such is just very high, much higher than you know, where you know you're comfortable with the management. Because if it's a second generation of management, they're coming, changing things. Yeah, but you know, uh, what about the other employees? They've been there with the business for long. You know, if you ask them to change the way they have been working for so many years, for decades, right? And you ask them to change, it's not that easy. It will cause friction. There'll be some um, churn in the management in that case. So we've stayed away from this theme. Right, we want. We are like, hey, if this guy is the new person who's coming. He or she is doing a good job. We'll watch it for next five years, six years. Uh, meanwhile, there are other opportunities also available. It's okay that you know we might miss out on it for few years, but you know markets always keep giving opportunities. At some point, once we get the comfort, uh, you know, we can act. there's no gun to our head to act at that point in time. So. Yeah, that. yeah. We we find it's it's very uh, you know rare for uh, people to change um, you know and and that is something which uh, we are open minded to if there's this next layer of management or next generation of family members that are there that is something that you know we will evaluate but ultimately the the quality of uh, the the corporate governance uh, lands up is giving hints. Uh, exit employee, how is you know what is the plant manager saying? Uh, you know what is their friend saying um, about them? You know what is their level of ethics? What is the competition saying? So these are things that anyway you know we have to check. And upfront in our screening process, what we do is we don't take companies out if there's just a rumor or we've heard something that oh there's some questionable corporate governance. We actually need verifiable information that either some auditor or some ex-employee. You know, somebody has given us some real information that no, this is not a good company. Then we will, you know, stay away from it. Uh, but uh, you know, next generation professionalizing 
uh, companies, private equity investors coming in. There is a bunch of change. And so this keeps us, you know, on our toes uh, where, uh, you know, as companies keep coming up in our screening process once every six months, this is the question we ask is, has there been any change? If yes, then okay, you know, let's see if it makes sense to, you know, spend. Really, our biggest worry is actually whether our moors become chores, right? We are more worried about that than finding chores becoming more. So, you know, just as investment managers are evolving and investment management is evolving, I'm guessing after looking at sessions like these, management is also evolving. They are also becoming smarter and <laughs> most commonly uh, how to avoid red flags which analysts can see, right? So it's becoming more harder and harder for capital. Yeah. But let me sort of come back from a, you know, passive, uh, you know, uh, perspective. Isn't everything built in price? Isn't market sort of discounting everything already? I mean, if, even if you have some red flags or otherwise, it will be all, already visible in the market, right? And to that extent, you should always buy, uh, you know, the so-called uh, quality stocks, which, which are trading at 70, 80 multiples and, you know, are kind of up there in the sky. Uh, you know, so I think two, two points there. So I think one is uh, the market, uh, the definition of market in terms of the timelines that investors have, uh, and that varies, right? So some market participants are short-term oriented, some are long-term uh, in, in, in orientation. So for example, if you have a miss of uh, one quarter or two quarters of earnings, and sometimes prices are uh, you know, very, uh, you know, very high, uh, things correct. You know? So for example, uh, you know, page industries, um, you know, PA is uh, Papati, GE is Ganomal. That's my wife's great grandmother. And we've been lucky. We have some access into the, into the management. And, uh, you know, we uh, were kind of not in the business of chasing a running train. Um, and so we had invested years ago, you know, we had, uh, uh, we had, we had exited. Um, and then I think in 2018, um, there was a miss on, on quarter earnings. Um, and price went from, I think, 18, 19,000 to maybe 10, 11,000 in a very quick uh, time. And uh, it was probably the fastest that we've ever added uh, in terms of uh, a, a position going into our core portfolio because we were so confident of the business. It's just that the valuations, you know, were not there. So, you know, that is uh, something which uh, is, uh, is something that we've done. And the timelines, because mutual funds sometimes don't pay, you know, short-term capital gains tax. There's a heavy trading mindset. So the timelines that, you know, the market has, I think is really, you know, something to point out. The second thing is the level of work done is, uh, you know, on the, you know, on the face of it, there may be, uh, you know, uh, uh, companies where on the outside, you know, it may not be as um, interesting um, and the PE, uh, is a great example, right? So Hatson, our milk business, uh, they have a very strong connect with uh, their farmers. 300,000 farmers on a daily basis. They get milk from the vans go a distance to the moon and back on a daily basis to collect, collect milk uh, from, their, from their farmers. And the issue that they have been able to resolve with their farmers is to connect with the farmers on money. If I'm giving you milk, right? I'm, I want to know how much money you're going to give me back for this milk. And so they have 10,000 eco analyzers in each of their locations where they collect milk, where instantaneously a farmer gets a text message that this is how much money you know, we owe you. Now the promoter has taken a very aggressive stance on the depreciation. He wants to depreciate as fast as possible. So the P's look artificially high, right? And I mean, they are high right? the, the earnings is, is, is less, but is the business qualitatively doing a good job? Uh, Danone, the French dairy giant, tried to enter and had a very hard time. The state cooperative boards, you know, pretty much don't give realistic competition, you know, to Hatson. And when we went and spoke to Amul um, and said, is there any company you respect? He said, there's only one company I respect in the ecosystem. So in 2013, when Hatson has been around for many decades, public company for, for a while, and other investors could have, you know, seen uh, the PE kept many other investors away. But for us, uh, we one of the only companies we value on an EBITDA, you know, basis are very, you know, kind of open in that. Yes, it has been an expensive business, but the growth in the business over the last six, seven, eight years 
has been you know phenomenal they've had very strong pricing power and then now recently it's translated into you know stock price uh, you know returns so and and then the third uh, and i'll be quick here is on certain pre ipos right percent we invested for 6 7 8 years you know mother sun sumi we've been invested for over a decade if for the first year two years if a company is private it's okay you know going at the time of ipo 100 times over subscribed tough to get an allocation we can go earlier do diligence at a pace that we're comfortable with build a position size that we're comfortable with potentially benefit in terms of the pricing the gain from where we entered to the ipo price and then that's the other area where there's i guess um, information asymmetry uh, where being a private company uh, the pub, the markets are not fully aware of these businesses and it's you know for us uh, maybe you know 10 15 20% uh, of our portfolio is such type of companies where they are looking to go public uh, and we are lucky that they are open to having discussions with us and so we start engaging with companies you know 3 4 5 years prior to ipo because we know that if you come at time of ipo they are very busy the other investors talking to them at the same time you may not get uh, you know and so aptis is a great example there where we've been engaging with them since 2017 2018 and the company has just gone public this year in in august and we were able to come in um, at you know better price so i think from a market perspective these are some of the inefficiencies that we look to uh, capitalize on sure i have one last optional question for both of you how many times the checklist fail four four times um is in our 13 years uh, the we are very transparent with our investors uh, ultimately as fiduciaries we owe it to our investors to be completely uh, transparent and uh, so in our uh, in our 13 years after we made an investment we saw certain corporate governance you know concerns come out and uh, we exited based on that um, and the learnings there are many learnings there right but one of the key learnings is staying in touch with your businesses the value system continuing to do plant visits and doing exit interviews we cannot underscore this exit interview part where that's the best source of gup or inside information on a company sometimes in, on just just you know how did the management treat you you know what was your experience right did you have a good working culture uh, was it a, a, a you know a nice working culture to be in uh, you know and so some of these things give a lot of answers uh, to us and uh, you know that's the biggest source of you know red flag but uh, we're not happy with the track record but we have four um, you know mistakes that we've made and we uh, are transparent with our investors you know on that the bd those are mistakes of commission right four mistakes of commission but maybe four mistakes of omission everybody is allowed to do mistakes you're not allowed to repeat the same mistake twice so yeah. thank you so much ashish and akshay for uh, those insights and those comments uh, and thank you uh, once again for uh, sharing your thoughts uh, over to you <laughs> 